Farming takes faith. And faith and farm and family is the three things that I believe is at the core of my character. Billy Curl. I was born on March the 26th, 1954. I'm the third child and the second son. They tell me that I, on that day in 1954, there was snow on the ground. Uh, we, we live in the Oak Hill section of LaRue County, uh, three, maybe three miles from Sonora. Dr. Rout, who was our doctor, was out of town. And so my dad went down to the Sonora Crossroads to meet a Dr. Bradley from Elizabethtown to come out to the house where I was born. On the night that I was born, uh, before dad got back with the doctor, uh, the neighbor ladies, Miss Morney Eastridge and, and Miss, Miss Mays were there with mama and I had been born by the time the doctor got there. My parents, married a rather late in life. My dad was 30 years old and my mom was 24 when they married. And they, they married in 1950. Uh, they were both raised in Upton, Kentucky. Both uh, basically single parents. My dad's father, Arthur Curl, died when he was two. His mother Myrtle Skaggs Curl died when he was 11, so he was basically raised by his grandparents, Scott Skaggs and Dora Russ Skaggs. And so he was uh, the, the only child, they, the, the Skaggses had three daughters, only one of them had a child and it was Howard and he was raised by them. And, but he was loved by his, his aunts also and so he was basically a single child, and my, my mother Margaret, her mother was Mabel P. Whitman Bugs, <laughs> uh, that, that was who she married later in life, and her, her father was James Albert Smith, and they never married, so she was raised by her great aunt and uncle, Eve McDougall and Mary Crick. McDougall of, of Upton, and so she was basically an, an only child, too. My mom always would use the phrase cheaper by the dozen, but she only had half a dozen. So I wound up having six children. My oldest sister's Myrtle, and then my oldest brother was Jimmy. Then I came along. Behind me was my brother Kenny. Behind him was Wyoma. And then the last child, Martha Sue, was born in 1960. We lived there, you know, it was on the Falkerson farm, we were sharecroppers and lived there for about a year and then we moved to the Siberia section of LaRue County, maybe a mile around the road there. Siberia is a, it's a rural farming community and off of Highway 84, there's a road that runs through from Highway 84 over to 31W, what, by what they call the halfway house. And so in that section, it was uh, some farms, and that's where we, we were sharecroppers there on my cousin's farm for about another maybe 10, 12 years, something like that nature. We raised a tobacco crop, and then we had cows, uh, milk cows. We milked them by hand. I always had some few hogs, maybe a few chickens, and trying to just survive during those years. I tell people I'm from Siberia and they think I'm from Russia, <laughs> but I'm not. The name of the community, it was named because of a man named Cy Berry. And they said he would sigh when he talked. And so everybody called him Cy, and his name was Berry, and they named it Cy Berry. but my parents would always get us to church. And sometimes times are so hard that, that we didn't even have a car. And uh, others from the church would come and get us, take their family to church, come and get us, two loads of us, 
to take there, and I, I always thought, uh, don't know what mom and dad had to go through to get that. Mom and daddy wanted to instill in us. Uh, they wanted us to get saved, and they wanted us to know the Lord. And, and so you go, you 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 get there. Well, some people are in, and some people are all in. And I say my parents were all in, and they wanted their children the same way. You go to church, and you uh, and somebody somebody you know they would have devotion. Usually that's what they called it, but you know someone would start saying maybe he. Maybe he would do a line hymn, you know, where he would say a phrase and then the congregation would sing a phrase. And they, sometime it would be music or piano player and sometime it would just be the pattern of the foot or the man with the cane that would keep the time. And we would always at Sunday school, we were ahead of uh, uh, Baptist Training Union. Uh, we'd have Sunday school reunion. And so there were a lot of times that we, it wasn't, all at your church, it would be at other churches. And so they made sure we got to Vacation Bible School. We'd go to Vacation Bible School at Walnut Hill in Upton. We'd go to Sonora Baptist. We would go to to uh, Siberia Baptist, and we'd go to Glendale. We'd go to all those. And it was in 1961. I'm seven years old, seven and a half. So I, I knew the Lord had been tugging on me, but... From my early existence, I can't remember when we didn't go to church. I can't remember us taking a Sunday off. Sometimes church would be every other Sunday, like second and fourth, one and three, but we would always go to another church. And so uh, revival has come to Warner Hill. The pastors, Dr. J.H. Brooks, uh, great man of God, and uh, uh, God blessed me. Uh, he was my cousin. He was Cousin John until he became our pastor, and then he was Reverend Brooks. And so something, it was something special about him, but he was our pastor only three years. But he happened to be the pastor then, but revival has come. And, and the amazing thing is, I can remember my pastor, but I can't remember who the evangelist is. And so in that day in revival, in, in those years, we would have what you call a mourner's bench. You would set aside a, a pew. Usually, you would the, the children would set up front, so you you have your attention on the pastor, on the message, and uh, um, so I wanted to be saved. Felt like the Lord was tugging at me. Revival began on on probably that Sunday morning, but I remember that Sunday night going to the mourners bench and seeking my soul salvation and. And praying and asking, you know, Lord, save my soul. And I was taught that the only prayer that a sinner has is, Lord, save my soul. A lot of them think they can pray and unsaved people can pray, but it doesn't get any. There's no power to it. And so, so Sunday night I didn't get to get in. Monday night we go back, and uh, the service of revival would begin. It would begin with an with an altar prayer, where they would come around the the, the mourner's bench, they would pray and uh, in those days, and we didn't play music during revival. The piano player wouldn't play. It was about praying and, and the message. And so there'd be a prayer, then the preacher would preach, and then after he would preach, and uh, they would come back around uh, the, uh, the mourner's bench and pray. And so I didn't get in on Sunday night, Monday night, or Tuesday night. But something happened Wednesday night. I cried those first two nights. I, I moaned. I tried to get in, but I couldn't get there. And so, But on Wednesday night, it was down to business. And the amazing thing is that on Wednesday night, uh, the song, I saw the light. What happened to me was... A light came on in my heart, and God changed me. I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, so on Wednesday night, uh, uh, I didn't tell the church, but on the way out, I told my pastor, I remember looking up at him, and I said, God saved me. And he said, he said, can you tell the church? And I said, Yes, sir. You know, I bring them back in. He said, no. He said, tomorrow night you'll have to tell the church of your experience. And so on Thursday night, I stood before the church and told how 
Jesus was, uh, who was God's son and he died on the cross and forgive me of my sins. I probably didn't say all that. All I know was he saved me. He gloriously changed me. Yeah. You know, of all the people in the world, he still had me on his mind. Got saved the last week of October, 1961, that on the second Sunday in November, they decided that would be a good day to baptize. And at Warner Hill Baptist Church, there is no baptistry in the church. There's no heated water. We baptized down around the road, around the old road, or 31, not too far from the church, at McCandless Branch. And early on, uh, second Sunday in November, I can remember my dad and the other deacons, and they there was a long bank. The pastor stood in the water, uh, had on a big coat. I, so I just remember, had on a long black coat and a big tall stick. And I said, I know this story. It's about John the Baptist. His name is John. <laughs> We're at Water Hill Baptist Church, and I'm going to be baptized. And I'm sure my brother Jimmy was baptized at the same time. I can't remember who else got saved in that revival. And I've heard people say they got saved and seven others. All I know is I got saved. And so uh, Reverend Brooks came out, and, and of course he's in the water. They let me down the bank. I walked out. He took me by the hand, and, and uh, I just remember the sun shining beautifully. It had to be cold. It's November. Second Sunday in November, he baptized me. He raised his hand, and he said, he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And he took me down. And while down, while down in the water, I remember the sun shining down on me through that water. And this is one of the glorious things about second Sunday in November was I got baptized. We go back to church, and this is the Sunday that we exercise the second ordinance, which is Holy Communion. And I'd been sitting there and watching. Of people and watch them get happy and I thought you know, I didn't understand what was going on but this Sunday I get to partake. I'm not sure whether my great aunt Mama Eve still made the unleavened bread or whether my mother was doing it by then but so we've got this flat bread baked at home but brought to the church and blessed before the congregation, the, the pastor and the deacons would break this bread and tell, and tell them uh, what communion meant. And so I got to eat the, the, the broken body of Christ that Sunday. And I thought to myself, this, this is not like the vanilla wafers ain't none he would give me. <laughs> I want vanilla wafers It had some sugar in it. I went to Georgetown Elementary School. Began school in, in, in 1960. Attended there for the first uh, five years of my public education. Uh, back then, they didn't have kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, and all those things. And so I got, one day they, they dressed me up. I get to go to school. And so this is the year before I, I, I start school. And so, uh, I think this is really going to be cool because my Aunt Noonie, her name was Lucy Curl Stone, and she was a great teacher. Everybody loved her. And, uh, and so she uh, takes me to school one day, and I'm thinking, boy, this is the, this is the bomb. And then when the, but then when I started, nobody told me. She retired. <laughs> so I began in the first grade uh, at Georgetown School. there At Georgetown there was three, it was a segregated school. Uh, there was three rooms and a hall, so it wasn't a one-room school house. At Georgetown School, they had outhouses. This is in the 60s, with we outhouses at home. A lot of people, and so, but they came out and, and they decided to funnel some money into separate but equal and so they built new toilets. Instead of putting bathrooms on the, I couldn't understand that. And so now instead of one hole, there's two holes. And, and the books, you know, we're gonna bring you new books this year, but they were used books. 
at the time that I started, I think it was eight grades. I think that I think when you graduate eighth grade, then you went to LaRue County High School. And so it was integrated, but the elementary was still segregating. And they would say separate but equal. I can remember, you know, having a lot of friends and a lot of a lot of good things. We would we would pray every every day. We would when we did pledge allegiance, we'd do the we we would also pray every morning. But in the first grade for me it was traumatic because as cute and handsome and smart as I was, my first grade teacher and I'm thinking it was her first year of teaching that she uh, she whipped me. Well, I don't know what I did, but she took my hand and did this and done a ruler to it, and it broke my little heart. But it taught me that I never got another whipping. <laughs> Should have had some more, brother. But I, but I got uh, yeah, yeah. But Miss 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 Lowe was her name. We became dear friends and I assisted in her funeral and she would always call me her boy. I had Miss Lowe probably my first two years. Miss Rush was my teacher, Miss Bertha Rush, just a dear friend. Lady went to church with us and uh, and uh, so she was my third and fourth grade teacher. And then uh, in the fifth grade, Miss Green, and she was the principal, I guess. So the fifth and sixth grade was her classes and she was the principal. But I remember when I was in the fifth grade uh, that she would, I, 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 we had big snow that year and I remember being out so I tried to get ahead on all of my lessons and, and uh, uh, but when I got, but when we got back to school she said because we've been out so long we're gonna skip all of that. <laughs> and, but she let me help teach the class in the fifth grade and so. The sixth grade, when I was in the sixth grade, I went back to Georgetown and they told me there's not going to be a first grade nor a sixth grade. And so I had to walk from Georgetown up to Hodgenville Elementary School. And that's when I began my integrated years. In the sixth grade, when I first went to Hodgenville Elementary School, I made straight A's. I had A in conduct. Conduct, <laughs> yeah, and effort. I had got A and, and 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 wound up, and I was so proud of that. And I thought this is gonna be a breeze. But in the seventh grade, we went to the junior high. And in the seventh grade, in the, in the sixth grade, you stayed with your class. But in the seventh grade, you got to walk up and down the halls, and and uh, you know you're going through this adolescent thing, and girls, and all of this is taking place, and Something happened. Somebody stole my brain. <laughs> but it was it was it it was a good experience. Had good had good friends. But the Lord was shaping and forming us. And Romans eight twenty eight is true, brother. All things work together for good. Didn't say they're all good, but God can work it to the good for those who love the Lord and call according to His purpose. Mr. Jack Mitchell, one of my best friends, and I love, I love uh, Jack Mitchell. He is no one, no one like him. No one has a heart like him. And he comes out to the house, brings some hurdles, and he says, "I want you boys to practice these hurdles." And he says, "And I'm going to put," and he said, "What he's going to put Jimmy in the race, and I'm going to put Kenny doing this." And he said, "He looked at me, and I'm long and lean and tall, and of course he immediately says, and I want you to run the mile.'" And I said, "I ain't running no mile. <laughs> I want to run something short and get the glory." But he said, "Well, you just stay here." And and he said, "And I'll I'll take Jimmy and Kenny." And you just stay here on the farm then. And they did. And they won and they and they won at the local AAU. They went to Louisville and ran and I never got to go. And I held a grudge against this man who said, Well you just stay here. And so I played football in the junior high and, and, and basketball and, and uh so when I'm coming a freshman, he's the freshman football coach and he comes to me and he says 
I want you to play ball for me. And I said, I ain't doing nothing for you. <laughs> I still remember, which is that we you know what, what the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So it wasn't my really my choice. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't play football for it. And he said, I want you to run for me. I ain't running for you. You know, and and and, and they may have got to go to, from Louisville to St. Louis and maybe New York would would have got to go to New York, New Orleans or something. And I'm thinking. And he wanted to just leave me there. I just stay there now. So I'm playing basketball. And so the first two years of my high school, I didn't run track. And I played ball. And, and that was my loss by my the hardness of my heart. And so when I became a junior, I went out for the track team. And I found out that I was good. And I wasn't just good, I was very good. But because my kind of attitude was not right, he didn't coach me as hard as he did. I, did. I, wanted, to, I wanted to please him, but I didn't. But he, he, he backed off on me, that's what, what I thought, that's what I know. I read the quarter. The quarter was the horse race. It's a quarter mile. Back those days, it was 440 yards, and of course it's 400 meters now. But it's a sprint. If you're a good, if you're a good quarter man, you sprint it. So I had a good time. I think the best time I ever had was like a 50.4. Basketball and track, and uh, but track was was my love. I graduated high school on June the 2nd, 1972. That time I had been blessed with uh, favor of God. And uh, a lot of people had, you know, they'll give you gifts and money and all of this kind of thing. So about the, that was the second. And probably about the ninth, I guess it was, my brother Jimmy asked me, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, brother, I just be honest with you, I ain't gonna do nothing. <laughs> I've got some money, you know, probably had two hundred dollars, or maybe two fifty, like that's gonna gonna be enough to get by on. I said, I'm not gonna do anything. And he said, you better get a job, boy. And I thought, oh, okay, just to appease him. My older brother, 18 months older than me, always been my big brother. You know, when I didn't have a car, I'd drive his car and things of that thing. And so I go in, I put an application in at Dow Corning in Elizabethtown, and uh, I believe it was the 11th day, might have been the day I put it in, or somewhere in that neighborhood. Put it in, they called back, did an interview, sent up for a physical and began work on June the 19th, 1972. Didn't even have time to think about being out of school. And so, so that began uh, a relationship there at the plant from 1972 until 2006. I went through a lot of departments and a lot of things. Tried, tried to do some things. Uh, Thought I'd be a supervisor, and that wasn't it. And wound up being, I guess you would say, the pastor of the plant. <laughs> so that, that, that was the only pastor that they knew. You know, so, uh, but it's really about when, when, you, when, when you're Christ-like, you can't put it on and take it off. My daddy said I wouldn't have a water faucet religion, one you could turn off. I wouldn't wouldn't have one like that. You've got to have living water, the kind that will spring up in everlasting life. And I believe that that's what that's what I'm called to do. I've made friends uh, in Honduras. Uh, made friends in Africa, still have some brothers in Africa. In fact, I talked to one uh, by the way of the phone just the other day. And he's my friend and my brother. 
He said, I think you realized it too. I hadn't been, I'd been out there but twice, but I, he's my brother. Thank God for putting him in my life. But God loved me enough that he put this lady in my life named Eunice Maribel Dixon Curl. And so we began to, to I'd, I'd always see her church because we would do church things together. And, uh, and she tells me that she would write me notes and Throw them away, but I didn't see them. But, I, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but but we fell in love, and uh, we began dating in October of uh, 1973 and got married June 29th, 1974. And we got married at, uh, at her church, which is Mount Vernon Baptist Church in Bodyville, Kentucky, by her pastor, Reverend, C.G. Ford from Summersville. Reverend Ford was, uh, he was very nervous about this wedding. I don't know how many weddings he'd done. I, I know what I'm thinking. So much so that uh, when we go through the rehearsal, now this is kind of strange, that we, re we did the rehearsal on the day of the wedding. That morning, we are going to do a walkthrough. So we're trying to rush him up. We say, you know, just say etc. and go on. And during the ceremony, because he was nervous, he said etc. <laughs> but we did the rehearsal, and he, and he says, "You do have the. This is on the day of the wedding, on a Saturday morning." He says, "You do have the license." We said, "What license?" And the courthouse is closed. So uh, Eunice's dad, Leonard, knows the uh, clerk down at Hart County. He knows him. They call his house. His wife said he's gone fishing. Oh, Lord. But God. But God. And he gets home. His wife tells him. He calls back. We go down. We get the license the day of the wedding. And uh, we get married at 6 o'clock on the 29th. And uh, the Lord blessed us. Very, very, a large wedding, most of them are. The church is full. My best man, he'll tell the story a different way, but he tells me, as we're standing up there and we're waiting for my bride to come into the church, I look at him and I said, oh no, this means I can't run around with y'all again. And he says to me, shut up, boy. <laughs> There's no back door in this church, amen. And so, but he lets me know that, that he loves me and, God comes by and blesses, blesses the wedding and has blessed us ever since. 48 years now that we've been, been married and uh, hadn't always been easy, but it's always been God in it. Amazing thing. I was still running from God while we were, you know, for the next several years. I'm not only trying to make a marriage work and I'm working my job and farming on the side, but I'm still running from God. And God's still loving me. He keeps drawing me back home, says Prodigal. There's bread enough in at home. And so he, he, he wins in the end. He wins. May the 16th, 1976, our first baby came along. Of course, we would always have children in the home, but this was our... And Nietzsche Jamel Curl, she came a little early, but she was right on time. And she, um, she loves the Lord. She loves the Lord. She's really been an inspiration in my life. She's uh, blessed us. Great singer, great singer. Has a testimony how God spared her in a bad automobile accident. Granddaughter named McKenna. McKenna's 12, she'll be 13. Um, August the 30th, a day before her grandma's birthday, August 31st. And then 1979, February the 6th, came our second child. A boy, and his name is William Scott Curl. But he's a 
Somebody's preacher. He's preaching pastor and he's pastor of Plymouth Hill Baptist Church in Green County. He's married and he has four children and, and uh, they're doing a great work there for the Lord. And so God has blessed us, blessed our family. He, uh, he's blessed uh, all of our siblings. We have one, one brother, Jimmy, who's gone on to be with the Lord. And uh, uh, we are still trusting God. Mother and father both, uh, dad died September 27th, uh, 2000. Mama died August 14th, uh, 2001. And in between, Jamie lost his life, our nephew. So we had tragedies right there, but but still, God is faithful. He's got a mercy and a grace. And uh, I know he's gonna see us through. They tell me, some of them gone on like Jimmy and uh, the other boys and things, they say, but you were different. And, you know, sometimes, is that good or is that bad? But God had a calling on me. I would maybe had compassion or desire to, to be in his presence. And, and, and when, he come, when he comes by, when the Spirit comes by, you know that. You can't harness it up yourself. You can't conjure it up. And so God just kept loving me. And, I, and I, those things that I said I didn't do, I did do. Things that I shouldn't, I had no business doing, I did do. Fourth Sunday in April, 1992. When I announced my call, the amazing thing is, I get back in church, teaching Sunday school. So they had me to teach the adult class and because I'm I'm uh, not accepting my call to preach. Guess what I do when I'm teaching Sunday school? I preach. <laughs> Can't sing a lick, but I but I got a song, and when I sing a song, I preach. And when I pray, when I lead prayer in, in the church, I preach. And so I'm doing all those things, but still not accepting. And uh, but that fourth Sunday in April, the morning. Uh, speak where it, it was someday. I don't know if it's family day or church anniversary or what it was, but Reverend Charles Dixon preaches that morning. And then that afternoon, Reverend Stafford Dixon, the pastor of Allen Seminary Baptist Church, and he's Eunice's cousin, both those are. And, uh, and so he preaches. The whole time he's preaching, I'm fidgeting. I can't figure out what's going on. And the way our service works, you know, when he finished preaching, I call the deacons up, the deacons lift an offering is the way they do that. And so my dad testifies every service, every Sunday. And so I think it's a joy just to be a deacon with him. And, uh, and so he gets up and he testifies and he says, I don't know if my son has anything to say or not. And I say, mm-mm, because I know if my mouth opens, it's going to come out. I say, uh-uh, and I make about two or three steps towards the table, and I say, I don't know. It, that, it doesn't matter whether you're for me or against me. God's calling me to preach. And about that time, someone begins, someone screams out in the church. They knew it was coming. They didn't know when. And, and uh, the church just catches on fire. I don't, somebody sang, somebody, it was just, it's just glorious uh, that God says. And the pastor, Reverend Arlene Franklin, at that time, he said, he said, we're not going to hold this young man back. He said, this is the fourth Sunday in April. He said he's going to preach his initial sermon on the second Sunday in May. And nobody thinks that's Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah, how crazy is that? You don't do that. You think things through, not when the large lady. God allowed me the second Sunday in May, and the Lord, and the Lord tells me, and you're to preach your initial sermon at First Baptist Church in Hodgenville. But you always preach your initial sermon at your home church. The Lord said, no, you're going to preach it at First Baptist in Hodgenville. And so... 
I call the pastor. He says, yes, everything's set. And then my pastor says, I think y'all are preaching at home. The devil tries to get in. Confusion. And, uh, and I, just, I just go in prayer and talk to the pastor over here, Reverend Price. I, they're open and welcome and waiting. That's what, you know, y'all can do whatever you want to. But that's what the Lord told me. And so the second Sunday in May, we come to Hodgenville First Baptist Church. And the church is full, standing room only, 17 pastors. And, and they all say, well, we knew you was going to preach. We just had to, let, had to let make sure that God was the one leading you. It's not your choice, young man. On the night of my initial sermon, my first sermon, not only do my friends and the neighbors come, and Mr. Beams and the Slack family, and it's, but it's mixed congregation. It's not just, you know, African American or whatever, not black. It's just people that either want to see Billy <laughs> do what God said, do or fall on his face. I don't know, but they were full, you know. Church came, church. We had church at night. He had a plan, and I didn't didn't really fully understand it. Ten months after I preached my initial sermon, began pastoring at Little Zion Baptist Church at Glendale, and uh, they took me, and God blessed them. And, uh, but I had a heart for evangelism. Still have a heart for evangelism. I believe that that's, that's the key of the, of, the, of, of the whole gamut of life, of that not only you being saved, but see someone else get saved. And so... And so but, but when it really, when God really moved me, he, he became president of the association of the uh, convention, which was the, the teaching arm of the association. Did that for five years, almost like immediately. And then went, finally it was a five-year tenure, rolled off in July. In September became moderator. That didn't happen. You had to be second vice and then first vice and all of this kind of thing and rise up in the ladder and had another thing and so he was just blessing us sending us to everywhere doing revivals we would do as many as 20 week long revivals in a year that was strenuous you know take take so much out of you but it would put so much in you also I'm still working full time and I'm still farming I'm still raising the family and all of that, but it's still, but it's God first, and uh, so so we're doing we're doing that, and then in uh, we did a revival at a church in well everywhere we were just everywhere we were at we were at you know all over Hart County, Green County, Taylor County, Hardin County, <laughs> so all, all these different churches and and. Uh, but the Lord, but the Lord, we finally went over in Casey County. Pastor over there asked me to come to a church, and we went to this church, and uh, something happened while we were there. We had a week or two of revival there, and one night we loaded up the car, ready to leave, coming back home. Had to work the next day, and uh, had folk going with us, and and they said, "Come back, to Brother Jeff won't see you." And Brother Jeff went back in there, and he said, "Brother, let's pray." And I get down on our knees, we pray, and, and he said, Lord showed me, he said, he's going to lead you to a people that do not look like you, and they'll follow you because of the Christ in you. And by now, I'm thinking, I'm going to Africa, or Korea, China, India, I'm going somewhere else, you know, and, uh, but God has a plan. He has a plan. He moves me from Glendale, Kentucky, to Cecilia, Kentucky, <laughs> to people that did not look like me. <laughs> but he's but he's 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 always blessed. The word has has there's no color in the word other than the blood of Jesus. If we can get them under the blood, we can get them saved. We can get them set free. You have to have discernment. Because if the, if the devil can't get you with temptation or anything else, he says, well, let's just work him to death. Let's kill him. We've had some struggles physically out of 2003. Broke my back. 
2012, diagnosed with cancer. 2017, had a heat stroke, something like that, but even, but different, you know, 2019. I believe it was a heart attack. Last year, we go in the hospital after doing a funeral of a 27-year-old who is, who has committed suicide. And uh, uh, on my way home, my wife drives me by the hospital, wind up being in there eight days, gallbladder surgery because they say my pancreas has been heated up caused by the gallbladder. But in all those things you can look back and see God. His hand of healing and of mercy and, and uh, he truly does what he says. I go to prepare a place and that place is not only over in glory but it's in here. Uh, he's preparing me, and when he, when he gets me fully prepared for that I'll fit the prepared place, then I'll go home. I'd like to be remembered that folk know that I am redeemed. I've been bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. And if anybody asks you, just who I am, you can tell them that I am redeemed. Praise his name.